never, may we never lose sight of that and trust you in the good times and in the bad times. Lord, thank you for your righteousness and how that righteousness is imparted to us. Lord, we love you and we give you this day. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. He is our anchor. Amen. Christ alone, cornerstone, cornerstone, anchor, our foundation, our solid rock. That's who he is. And uh, that's why we're here today. We're here today uh, to worship him. We're here today to get a fresh word from him. And so that's what our heart is. And we're uh, going to do that today. And we're going to look in Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is where we're going to start. And we're going to kind of move around throughout the scripture today, but this is going to be our main text for today, Psalm 1. So you can go ahead and begin to turn there. I love the book of Psalms. It's a great book. It's a book that, you know, it's dead smack in the middle of our Bible with Psalms and Proverbs. We begin to think of just, it's just honesty. Every time I read through the book of Psalms, I think of just how honest the psalmists are. You know, David would, you know, he writes a good chunk of those, but then you have all, all types of psalmists that, that have penned these. And I love their honesty. I love their authenticity. I love how they're just real. And whether they're having a wonderful day or they feel like they're in a, on a mountaintop experience with God, you know, they're penning it. You know, God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they're, they're penning it. And if they're just having it like David, David's heart would be overwhelmed often and David would be struggling or maybe thinking back to some of the previous sins in his life. And maybe it was with Bathsheba or with Uriah and the murder of Uriah. And he's looking back and just being brutally honest. Doesn't God want our authenticity today? Amen. He wants us to come before him in spirit and in truth and just to say, God, here I am. Uh, there's nothing in and of myself that I count worthy. There's nothing in and of myself that pleases you. The only thing that pleases you is Christ in me. And so that's what we see very often as we look through the book of Psalms. Has anyone ever just felt like hitting the reset button on maybe a decision you've ever made? Amen? <laughs> we've, I think we've all been there. You know, I can think back growing up. Uh, with my brother. I've got one brother seven years older than me, so you could see how that would go. You know, there's a lot of, there was times we fought it out and duked it out like a lot of brothers did. And uh, often, you know, when I would, uh, when I was winning a game or uh, playing uh, the Atari, anybody remember Atari? Remember Nintendo and all those good things? You know, for some reason, every time I would begin to beat him in the eighth inning of like techno baseball or something on these games he would hit the reset button he was just like I'd be up by two or three runs hit the reset you know I never did that to him okay so it was only one-sided right no but often it could be with a game or be like nope you're not gonna win oops my foot hit the reset button or you think often about maybe just a decision uh, it can be anything it could be maybe this year is the year that I'm gonna lose weight this year is the year I'm gonna exercise and so what happens January rolls around and and uh, we, we start a brand new year. We hit the reset button in our life. And we begin to say, God, this is the year. Family, this is the year. And so January and February start off great. And, and some make it, some don't, and some wait till next year. And we hit the reset button. Uh, could be just, maybe it's been your computer. Anybody ever lost data or just lost some of the things on your computer? Amen, right? It's a love-hate relationship sometimes with technology. Sometimes it's a love-hate relationship and we, we can't live without it. And, uh, but sometimes we feel like we can't live with it. And maybe you've been like me, you've had a paper or something due, or, you know, I can think back to some of my school papers and, 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 and still, you know, I can think back, I've lost some. And I'm like, I saved it. You know, and you get five, six pages into something, it's gone, right? And uh, somehow the reset button got hit and the, your, your save uh, did not save like you thought it would, and it reset. You know, sometimes it can maybe even be a little bit more serious. Maybe it's, maybe it's a financial decision. Maybe it was something that we purchased. Anybody ever been there? Uh, we've been there in the sense of maybe you just said, why in the world did I make that purchase? And we would love to go back maybe six months ago or go back three years ago and go back ten years ago and hit the reset button and start over and say, oh, God, I should have never bought that. You know, I wish I could hit the reset button. You see, we all long for a reset button. Maybe it's as silly as growing up and with a video game or maybe it could be just a major life decision. We long for the reset button. Well, I'll tell you what, Psalm 1 is all about hitting the reset button in our spiritual life. Amen? 
If you've ever read through Psalm 1, as we're going to read through, these six verses are so powerful, and they really set up the whole book of Psalms for us. The psalmist just gets real. He gets down to earth. He gets to the place to say, look, this, it is what it is. What we do with God, what we do with our relationship with Him, really defines the decisions and the path of our life. And so here we are. We'll begin in Psalm 1. And as you read along with me, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. And let's remember the terrain of Israel, what well, it's very arid. And so for a tree to really stand out was really a sign to the Israelites, a blessing. You know, it stood out as, man, that's a, that's a blessing. That's a sign of blessing. And so a tree planted by streams of water was a beautiful sight, which yields its fruit in season. And it goes on to say, And those whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so with the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. You see, for us to hit the reset button, it really, we got to get real in our relationship with God. We've got to be real about where we delight and where we put our delight in our life. And so delight is a word sometimes we've, we've kind of bulled down to mean creamer. It means other things. Delight's kind of a word that's been watered down often. But when we look at the heart of what it means to delight, it's, it's where we find our joy. It's where we find our peace. It's where we find our definition of who we are. We find contentment and delight. And when we delight in the law of the Lord, that, that would be what? That's, that's the scriptures itself. Amen? Aren't you glad that we have the infallible word of God? Amen. I'm so glad that God didn't leave it up to 40 different men to write the Bible and pen the Bible and say, oh, you guys go figure it out. But it actually is the very Word of God. And when we tie that in with prayer and we tie that in with our personal relationship with God, we find a light. We find a light and we often can hit the reset button in our life. And what we need to know is that our goal when studying the scriptures should not be figuring out what it means to me. It, it should be what God intended for it to mean. That's so worth writing down today. I would, I would put that down if you like writing in the margin of your Bible like I do. Put that down with Psalm 1. Often a lot of the problems that we see today in the church, a lot of the problems that we see with division and we see with disagreements, we see with arguments we see with fights it starts with a statement like this often it's we want to define the bible by what it means to me right we want to take a passage of scripture we want to take a, a book of the bible we want to say well that's what it means to me and and uh, that's why we often have so many a prosperity gospel you know that's a great example of how the scripture has been taken way out of context and we can't just try to figure out what it means to me even though that sounds nice, that sounds good, how can I be happy? You know, how can I have peace? How can I, you know, understand what this passage of Scripture means to me? But it's all about what God intended for it to mean. Amen? And that's the beautiful journey we have as believers. The beautiful journey we're on as we're being made more and more into the image of Christ is that we're on this journey to figure out in God's Word, what does it mean? What does it mean? And I think all of us would say, man, I, I, I've got a long way to go. We all do. I do. We, we, we want to figure out what God's word means. What did God intend for this to mean? And so that's what our heart as believers has to be as we approach God's word. You see, that's what it means when we delight ourselves in the Lord is that we begin to find out what it means. Many have distorted the truth this way. You know, sadly, just in the last year and a half or two, uh, we've seen some mega churches, we've seen some churches rise up and say, well, you know what, the... It's really all about Jesus and God's Word, the Bible. You know, it can be wrong. It can, it can have some errors in it. It can, it, it can stand, and it's okay if, if it's not all there. If it's, our faith is bigger than the Scriptures, is what some pastors and preachers have said from the pulpit. I'm going to tell you right now, that is a lie from the heart of Satan. That is a lie that we should never 
embrace. This is our roadmap. This is our guide. This is the foundation upon we as believers stand on. And so our journey, our goal is to find out what it means, period. Not what it means to me, what it means to you, what it means to the church down the road. How do they interpret it? We all need to figure out what it means. And sadly, many churches are taking that lead from some very vocal leaders of our day that have said it's really not about the word. It's not about for the Bible tells me so kind of faith. It, you know, besides, we can leave the Bible out. Let's just leave it out. It doesn't matter what it says about some of the, the pertinent issues of our day. You know, that, that can just be up for debate. All, it's all about Jesus. There's no way we can attach Jesus from the Bible. There's no way that with your spouse you can detach and have a marriage outside of your spouse. Amen? You can't have a marriage outside of two becoming one. It takes two to become one to form a marriage under Christ. There's no way that we can try to separate Christ from the Bible, the revealed Word of God. Don't let anybody ever tell you that's right. It's a lie. It's a lie from the heart of Satan himself. Here's another statement that I love. Our, our youth are very accustomed to this. We went through this statement last year as we began to talk about our faith. Uh, you know, I have the privilege of teaching Bible classes here at the school, and I love teaching my students this. They memorize this. And I try to have them memorize it to freak their parents out so when they go home, they're like, what? You know? So the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies, and they claim their writings are divine rather than human in origin. I love that statement about our Bible. That's a statement that I've tried to put to memory not to just say, well, you know, it's a great statement to learn, but it's a statement that really defines what we believe. It's historically accurate. You realize that we have over 23,000 archaeological digs that have taken place uh, that we know of, and every single one of those is only confirmed, has only been able to confirm what the Scriptures say. None of them have been able to refute what the Bible tells us about the Red Sea, about what uh, even the, the pillars that Samson pushed down, or it can be the walls of Jericho, uh, so many things that we see when archaeology finally catches up with the events of Scripture. It can't refute it, amen? It's because historically it's accurate. Historically, over 23,000 archaeological digs, many of whom are not believers. I'd say 90, 95% of those archaeologists, they're not Christians. So you maybe expect somebody to try to fudge something if they were a believer, but no, the majority are far or are, are atheist or of another religion. And so they can't refute the evidence of 23,000 archaeological digs. And then we begin to look, they report supernatural events. How did that happen? Because eyewitnesses live during the time of other eyewitnesses. That's a beautiful thing. We all want an eyewitness in our life. If we're innocent, eyewitnesses can get us in a lot of trouble if we're guilty for something. But they, it was written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, Dr. Bauckham says. And then he goes on to say, they report supernatural events, which we know as the miracles of Christ, the resurrection, uh, uh, all the different miracles in the Old and New Testament. They claim their writings are divine rather than human in origin. That's our Bible. That's what we see. We see 6,000 manuscripts in the New Testament alone that point to the validity of Jesus you realize we have no other documents that even come close to 6,000 New Testament manuscripts? You know, the, the Declaration of Independence has 26 known copies. We have over 6,000 copies of the Gospels. We have over 6,000 copies of what took place. That was the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. And that, that tells us something happened. Whether you're a believer... Whether you're an unbeliever, it was reported in the scriptures. And the unbeliever, even though they, they may not accept Christ as Lord, Savior, and King, they couldn't deny what Jesus had done. They couldn't deny that he died on a cross. He rose from the dead on the third day, and he claimed to be the Messiah. These were reported over 6,000 copies, more than any other document in man's history we see just of the New Testament alone. This reporting about Jesus, reporting about the claims that Jesus made. We have over 350 prophecies in the Bible, messianic prophecies, a lot more than just 350, but three, over 350 prophecies we have just of Christ. And guess how many he fulfilled? He fulfilled them all. <laughs> Amen? You know what the odds are that we know? We look here, I know that the screen can be a little hard to make. I just took eight. 
And But what are the odds that Jesus would just fulfill eight prophecies that we find in the Scripture in the Old Testament, whether they're in Isaiah or Psalm or um, wherever it could be? is that we see all throughout the Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah. What are the odds? Well, you know, mathematicians have tried to put their mind around what would be the odds of Jesus just to fulfill eight of the prophecies. And they said that it's one in ten to the 28th power. That Jesus fulfilled, one person fulfilled eight prophecies listed in the Scripture. Well, we know that he fulfilled well over 350 messianic prophecies. Math can't even... uh, There's not a number that we can really call it or label it. We have to say it's to the 28th power. We can't even begin to say who Jesus is. All of creation screams. All of history, all of science, all of math, all of man's knowledge screams there is a God. And His name is Jesus Christ and He is alive and He's well and He's on the throne today. Amen? That's who He is. We can't begin to put our mind around who God is. We can only, when we begin to look at the evidence, that's what led many to Christ, like Lee Strobel and so many others who tried to pick apart the scriptures and pick apart you know, the manuscripts of the Bible. They, they were dumbfounded to say, man, it really is true. God is who he is. The God of the Bible alone is the God. And we should never neglect him. We should never neglect the scriptures for us to begin to say that is blasphemy. For us to begin to think that God's Word, revealed Word of God, is not actually God speaking to us, man, we, we've reached a place that grieves the heart of God. Stephen sang it earlier, and our praise team sang it earlier, God's Word is the anchor. And we didn't plan this out. I just love it. We were singing. I was like, amen, he is. And I was sitting there on this slide. God's Word is the anchor. Its greatest work takes place beneath the surface of our life where you can't see it. Amen. You know, right now, as, as we said earlier during Hurricane Irma, you know, I, I remember seeing a picture just from this weekend of, you know, several boats out in the bay and so many different places just anchored up. And, you know, I, I got that mental picture. And, like, that's, that's how we are as believers. You know, as the storms of life come and the doubts and uncertainties and the questions and, and all of the things that we face in life, the only anchor that we really have is God's Word. And we have the person of God. Our, our relationship with God is the anchor that holds It holds us. It holds us firm. It holds us steady. It's truth that never changes. Absolute truth doesn't change. I mean, I can't go to any of my back and my math teachers and say, I'm sorry, teacher, but, you know, I'm always going to put five times five is 30, you know, because I feel like it. It feels like truth to me. You know, five times five is 30. It's not 25. And I'm always going to mark it. And she's always going to mark wrong. Amen. It's because it's not true. And so for us to say that God is not God we're missing the mark, and we're trying to say, well, well, it's just a good religious book. It's just a book good, filled with some great illustrations and great stories. No, it is God's spoken word to us. Don't ever buy into the garbage that's being sold today that it isn't. And, that, and so today, we've got to call it like it is. We've got to say what God's word is. God's word really is the anchor of our life. It's the greatest work takes place beneath the surface. Think of Olympic athletes. I think back to last year as we watched the Olympics in Rio and uh, just think about all the hard work that goes in for the Olympics and, and now you start hearing about some of the Olympians as they're getting ready for the next uh, go round of these summer games and they're already training, already in the pool, already running, already uh, doing all the gymnastic stuff that just blows my mind. I'm like, how do you get your body like that? You know, so it, you, you think about these things, but they're already putting in the time. They're already working. You know, college football is we've we've begun. You know, and we think about where we are in that. All these coaches and teams that are putting in all the work, all the way down to the high school level. You see a lot of the work that's never seen. That's God's word in our life, and we've got to saturate ourselves in it. We've got to fall in love with it. We've got to. Uh, have a beautiful relationship with it. We've got to be in it daily. We've got to be in it hourly. We've got to be in it on our mind. We've got to be able to recite it. We've got to be able to pray it. We've got to be able to talk about it. Because we need it. It's what keeps us steady as believers. The anchor holds. And that anchor is the Word of God. It's what we see. So there's three things I'd love to point out today. As we uh, look at Psalm 1 and as we uh, look around also and a few other passages of scriptures. The authority of scripture defines who you are. The authority of scripture defines who you are. And I really want to say the authority of scripture today. Why? Because often we, we think of that in kind of a bad way. You know, we think 
you know, sometimes we hear the authority of Scripture. We're trying to tell somebody some, something that they need to be stopped doing. All right, it's like, well, based on the authority of Scripture. I'm going to tell you, it's a beautiful thing. The authority of Scripture is a beautiful thing. It's nothing we should be afraid of. It's nothing that we should be ashamed to say. It is. And just by a few, about five minutes of just showing you some of the evidence that God is screaming out in all of creation and all of man's knowledge, it ought to really establish some authority in our life. It's not a book of suggestions. It's not a book that we just pick up on Sunday morning. It's not just something that we look at and passing on our phone and go, oh, that was a cool little verse. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that one. You know, it, it, it's deeper than that. It's a beautiful relationship that we have with the authority of Scripture. You see, the authority of Scripture defines who you are. So we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. He calls us His masterpiece. There's so many other passages of Scripture where God calls us beautiful and He calls us fearfully and wonderfully made. You see, the average American spends about six to eight hours throughout the day with media of some form, whether that's on your phone, whether that's in front of your computer screen at work, and maybe that can be just TV. There's so many different forms of media that we saturate ourselves with. This isn't just a teenage problem. This is an American problem. This is a problem for parents and grandparents and everywhere else and social media and all the things. Many of this has led to eating disorders that we see from not only just guys and teenage girls and teenage guys to adults, but it also leads to material greed. Have you ever figured that out about material things? It's never enough, right? We, we always want the next best thing. We want the next hottest item. We always, that house is never big enough. That car is never new enough. Uh, that vacation didn't, didn't do it for us enough. And you see, that's the greed that, that we battle in our humanity. That's the, the nature of ourself to say we're never satisfied. And we'll never become satisfied unless we begin to view ourselves as God's masterpiece. We begin to view ourselves as God views us. We begin to look at ourselves and, and God, I want to be that tree planted by fresh streams of water. I want to thrive in you. I want to grow in you. And I want to plant my life in a life of consistency with your word. I want to plug in my life in a life of consistent prayer and uh, quality and quantity time with you. I want that to be said of me so that I can know that I am God's masterpiece. You see, when we begin to just saturate ourselves in this culture in which God's called us to be in it, not away from it, but it's so easy to define ourselves by how much money we have or by what kind of clothing we wear or what, what's the, the latest and hot, hottest gadgets that we have in our life. We define ourselves very easily. You see, we can never find real happiness and real joy outside of those things. God says, I call you my masterpiece. You are beautiful. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I want you to view others that way. Amen? I want you to begin not only to know that about yourself, but I want you to look to your left, and I want you to look to your right, and as you go to work, and, and for the unbelievers and the believers alike, I want you to view them as fearfully and wonderfully made, and I want you to view them in such a way that as I view them. Most of us don't have a problem knowing how God views us, right? I mean, we, we're, we're saturated with it. We're, we're encouraged by those words. I think the breakdown happens is about how we define others, and we don't reflect that very well many times because people don't fit in my category or in, or in my certain uh, idea of how they should live or what they should be like or what they should do. No, God says, I want you to reflect that same masterpiece mindset. I want you to be able to look around and begin to love people that way. I want you to begin to, to minister to people that way. I want you to begin to be friends with people in that way in order that the sake of the gospel might be advanced. You see, the authority of Scripture defines who we are Point two, the authority of Scripture equips you for the day. All Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed. Amen? I'm so thankful that it's not up to us. I'm so thankful that it is what it is. And whether you agree with that today or not, that is your decision. But this is what God says, and you can't deny it. You can't deny what He says about His Word. You can't deny about what He says about His character, about what He says about His Son. You see, the Bible is our roadmap. It's our guide. All scriptures, God breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God, you and I as believers, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need it. 
We need to fall in love with it. We need to be like Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China. He said, I can seldom read Scripture now without tears of joy and gratitude. He had developed something in his life where he'd fallen in love with the Word of God. He had fallen in love with his quiet time. He had fallen in love with just those still, small voice of Christ. Sometimes it's the, it can be the, the, the heart beating, the heart chasing, you know, those moments that you feel like your heart's going to jump out of your chest kind of moments that you feel the Holy Spirit working. But we fall in love. And it's so hard for us to begin to read the Scriptures without tears of joy and tears of gratitude. Why? Because there's all kinds of love books out there. There's all kinds of love movies, right? Guys, we've suffered through them sometimes, correct? We've, we've watched them with our spouse or with a girlfriend or whatever, and we remember, oh, man, here's another, you know, chick flick we call them or whatever we want to call them. But I'll tell you what, the greatest love story of all time is found right here. <laughs> the greatest love story is that God has never given up on his people. Even though we've run, even though we've abandoned him, even though we've done things that you read in the scripture like, oh, Why'd they do that? And then we realize, man, well, I do the same thing. I may just do it in a little bit of different context, but I do the same thing. It's the greatest love story of a God, of the Savior, chasing after us, radically pursuing us. Don't neglect your Bible. Don't neglect your prayer life. All Scripture is God-breathed. It equips us. It allows us to speak truth in each other's life. It allows us to rebuke and sometimes like, oh, you know, rebuke. But that's just we receive it and we give it. And that, that allows us to experience that together in people's lives. We need to hold each other accountable. Amen? That's what God's called us to do. We hold each other accountable and uh, we, we hold each other up. And it's also good for training. It's good for training in righteousness so that we can become more like Jesus and for correcting. It, it allows us to walk that path that God's designed for us. And we know that it doesn't change. It know, know that it doesn't waver. God loves us. But most importantly, I'd like to say point three, the, the authority of Scripture connects you to the God of the Scripture, which is what we're after. We're after the person of Christ. We're after the heart of God. And when we begin to fall in love with the Scriptures, it is the revealed Word of God. It's what He's given us. These beautiful 66 books written on three different continents by some 40 different authors over 1,500 years. They're written, and we have this collection of the Bible. And He's given it to us so that we can process it in our life. Not neglect it, not just set it on a shelf, not just get so comfortable with our phones and get so comfortable with technology that we neglect studying God's Word He's called us to that. You see, often I'm scared and often I, I talk with the students and we all relate to it. We, we know so much more, you know, about our favorite ball team. We know so much more about the, even right now as college football is blowing and going about our team, about our stats, about all the different uh, yardages and everything else. We know everything about our team that we need to know. We know how to navigate our phones. You know, I mean, I've got a four-year-old, Jackson, you know. Jackson could sit there and get on my phone. I'm like, how do you do that, you know, sitting there moving around. He knows. I mean, if he wants to play a game on my phone, he's like, boom, you know. I mean, it, it's wild. It's amazing how easy it is to pick up. We know how to navigate our phones. We know how to navigate uh, through ESPN. We know how to navigate through some other things that occupy our time so much better than we know how to navigate God's Word. And it ought to break us. It ought to break our heart to say, oh, God, forgive me. Lord, those things, there's nothing in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with those things, God, but they've become an idol. They've become something that I've invested so much time and, and so much energy and so much of my focus on. And I've neglected your word. I've neglected to know where to go in, in those times of need. or uh, I've, not, I've neglected to memorize scripture so that it can become that anchor in my life in those moments when I'm in pain and those moments of doubt and those moments of unforgiveness and those moments when I'm not representing the fruit of the Spirit. God, that verse can come to mind and it can refresh me and renew me and say, oh God, yes, yes, that's what I need to be doing. See how important it is that we get in the scripture? How important it is that we do not lose heart, though outwardly, we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 
16 through 18. That's what we do. We refresh ourselves. We need to be renewed. We need to be refreshed. And the only way we can do that is not the next self-help book or the next self-help speaker or the next, you know, uh, the next pill. The way we do that and where we start to be renewed, where we begin, where our starting point is and our finishing line is, is God's Word. God's time with Him. If you, if you need answers today about some things in your life, where do we need to go? We need to go to God's Word. We need to spend some time with Him in prayer. Prayer is beautiful because we listen and we talk. You know, And the reason we do that, and God's made it so simple, and the reason that we do that is so that we can be constantly connected to His truth and what He's revealed to us. So are the, is the authority of Scripture connecting you with the God of the Scripture? Don't just fall in love with the truth itself. Don't just fall in love with the history of the Bible or the archaeology of the Bible or the science of the Bible. Fall in love with the God of the Bible. Fall in love with the God, the author of the Scriptures. The Scriptures always point us to the person of God. The Scriptures should always point us to the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. And then we need to be able to focus on that and say, God, I need to be renewed. I can't do it in and of myself. I can't do it just by trying to neglect what, what I'm doing at this moment. How, how can I be renewed? Renewed is to realize who I am in Christ. And it, and it really is a beautiful relationship that we have. That moment that we accept Christ, isn't it beautiful? It's clear. It's, it's a new beginning, a beginning when we come to know Christ that will never end. Once we're saved, we're saved, the Bible tells us. When we truly come to know Him, He lives in us, He dwells in us, but often we all go throughout the week and we have those moments of regret and we want to hit the reset button. And often, you know, we'll, we begin to just dabble around in life. It could be, I've got some, this right here is lemon, no, that's, uh, yeah, this lemon juice. And so lemon juice today, I want it to represent something for us and it would represent gossip in our life. You know, gossip is nothing new. It's nothing new under the sun. It's been talked about all throughout the scriptures as well. Paul addressed it. Peter addressed it. Maybe you lost your temper with your child. Maybe on Monday. And then again, and, and as a parent, you just say, man, I feel like a failure. There I go again, just going off on my kids and losing my temper. And, and then on top of that, I just started gossiping or I posted something or I said something and I just shouldn't have done it. You see, our, our relationship begins to with God. It, it's not gone. It just begins to take on a different color. It begins to look different. It begins to not be as God had designed for us. And it's diluted. And it doesn't really, that picture doesn't look that clear picture of Christ any longer. And then maybe it comes Wednesday and we just find our moment in there. We, we've, been, we've been having that same sin habits in our life with maybe foul language. And as I take pickle juice, pickle juice represents, would represent foul language today. You know, and it leads to you know, curse in the name of God. We say, well, I'm not really saying God's name in vain. You know, I, I didn't use God's name. I didn't really do that. But I want to tell you what, any foul language it curses the name of God. And it's something that I, I learned at a young age, you know, and I still learn. But that, that's part of my testimony before I really got right with God. I used to love to, to, to pick fights. I used to love in early in high school, middle school. I would, I, I would do that. I would be one person at church and I'd be one person at school, and, and you see, for me, and maybe for you, you may struggle with jokes or profanity, or you struggle with maybe racism, or you struggle with other things in your life, and it begins to delude, and you say, well, I've never said those things, but what did Jesus say? Jesus said it's just as bad for us to think on those things. It's just as bad for us to say them in our mind and, and to dwell on it, and before long, we know that in our mind and, and then in our life, we're not demonstrating who Christ wants us to be, and we're not looking like that picture of Christ. And right here, got soy sauce. Soy sauce can be good on some things, but soy sauce would represent the sin maybe of greed or materialism. And we just find maybe on that Thursday of the random during the week, we just say, here I go again. You know, I'm, I just feel like my neighbor's got it better than me. I feel like, you know, I, I just can't stop this same battle. And maybe it's just unforgiveness. Just say, man, I in our life, we say, well, you know what? They never asked for forgiveness, so why should I forgive? You know, why? Well, scriptures tell us because Jesus forgave us first. And he causes us to forgive, and we no longer can see that fruit of the Spirit in our life. And 
the things that really define us as a believer and that, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, you know, those things are not obvious. We, we, be, we begin to just hate where we are as a believer and we begin to know that, man, I need to be, I need to be fresh, I need to be renewed. The beautiful thing is water's still here. And it may have all kinds of different ingredients in it like we do, and that, that can represent our sin habits. That can represent the things where we, we sin often or maybe uh, just a brand new sin in our life. But the beauty is it's not gone. It's not like it's been emptied out. Jesus is still there, but he calls us to repentance. He calls us back to a fresh relationship with him, calls us to fall deeply in love with his word and our, and our quiet time with him again. He calls us to fall deeply in love with repentance again. You see, that's what Israel struggled with. But when they finally began to get it right, like you and I, you know, grace is abundant. You know, grace is, is really one of those things that never ends. It, it never will leave us. It, it constantly is there. And we are so thankful that grace is greater than all of our sin. And it is. That's what grace does. Grace comes, and God says, just come and ask. And when you come and ask, you will find. And when you find, you'll begin to see that your relationship is made new. That's exactly what it does. It has come, and it's made fresh again. The grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, He comes, and He finds us out, and He says, Oh, Jason, oh, church, I, I find you, and I make you brand new again. Are you experiencing that forgiveness in your life? Are you experiencing that renewal? That's the beauty about grace, is that we don't have to try to obtain it through anything else but coming and just being real to God. Just say, God, you found me. You know where I'm at. You know where my sin habits are. You know where how I've tried to define myself by so many ways, so many things that are not of you. But I come to you today, God, broken. I want to have a fresh passion for your word. I want to have a fresh passion for prayer. I want the, the scriptures to connect me to the heart of God. And you see, when we begin there again, God's grace is so abundant, and it comes fresh, and it fills us again. never leaves us the salvation that we've experienced, but we've just become dirty. We've become sinful. We've become a poor picture and poor reflection of Jesus. And so when we come every moment, every day, we say, oh, God, I want to begin to view my sin like you see my sin. I want to begin to look at it and call it like you call it. I want to begin to read the scriptures and not determine and, and try to define it just for how it works for me, but I want to define it by what you intend to mean. God, I want the, the authority of the scriptures to define me. God, I want the authority of scriptures to refresh me, to renew me. Do you want that today? You can get it. And I know it's a simple picture of a glass of water about what God does in our life, but he can do that. How can he do it? There's nothing special about coming and uh, just trying to, to make a scene of an altar, but that something is beautiful about a picture of coming and kneeling before God. You can do it right there, yes, but maybe today you just need to come and you need to get real and just say, God, refresh me, renew me. Maybe today, unbeliever, you say, I just need to be saved today. I need salvation. I need that fresh water of Christ to pour over me and save me. I need forgiveness. I need a relationship with Jesus Christ. But maybe you're just like me, believer, and, and you just need to be refreshed. You need to be renewed. You need a fresh start today. Maybe from as soon as last night, some of the things that you may have been struggling with and that led to sin and the temptation that you gave into, know today you can come. He's a living water. He's the great I am. He, he seeks you out. He loves you. He's calling you today. Will you be obedient? to respond to him. We're here, and in a few moments, our, the rest of our staff will be down. So let's stand, and let's pray. You come. After we pray, we're going to have a time of response. If you want to be refreshed today, renewed today, if you want to have a right perspective and be aligned with the scriptures today and aligned with the heart of God today, you come. Let us pray for you. Maybe you just want to come with your family. You just want to come and kneel at the altar. And just say, God, here I am. I, I just want to bow before you and say, God, I, I'm getting it right today. I want to be refreshed today. I want to be renewed today.
I want to have a, a, a fresh perspective of what you want to do in my life and what you want to do in my family. You come. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you never change. There's so many things in life today that have changed, and we look around and we see the natural disasters. We see.